Well, this morning we are going to be continuing in Matthew's Gospel. We're in Matthew chapter 19, and we're going to get right into the Word this morning. We're looking at verses 16 through 30. I don't think y'all have been standing enough this morning yet, so why don't we stand uh, for the reading of God's Word. Matthew 19, verse 16. And behold, a man came up to him, saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly, I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is God's holy, perfect word. Amen? Well, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to come and sit under the teaching and hear your word. Father, I pray for this time, Lord, as we look at this passage God, that the, the truths that are in this passage would speak to us, that your word would speak to us. Lord, I pray that you would soften our hearts to receive what you have for us today. Lord, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So this story is one that you are probably familiar with. If you read through your Bible each year, you'll read this account three times a year as it's in all of the synoptic gospels. And this is a very important passage as it deals with one of the most important questions anyone could ever have. What must I do to have eternal life? Now who in here doesn't want eternal life? I think if we're honest, all of us want to live forever. Nobody wants to die, not on this life, but especially in the life to come. We all want to live forever. And so this young man, he was, he was hoping to come to Jesus to uncover the, the secret key, the, the thing that would unlock eternal life for him. And he's come to the right person to ask. If you were to ask anybody this question, Jesus would be the one to ask. But as we'll see, he doesn't get the answer that he was wanting. Jesus doesn't give him what he wants to hear. Jesus gives him the truth. But all of us at some point have, have thought what this young ruler has thought. What do we need to do to have eternal life? What do I need to do to earn my salvation? We've all had this thought before. In fact, this is what almost every other world religion teaches, is that you can do something to inherit eternal life. That the way that you live your life, your good deeds, the amount of money that you give, that this can produce and give you eternal life or paradise. That you can access eternity by what you do. 
Now, there's many problems with this line of thinking. First off, the idea that the way that you live your life could give you righteousness and right standing before God, just that idea in itself shows that you have a little view of God and a little understanding of who God truly is. God is, God is holy, God is righteous, God is perfect, and, and the idea that something that you could do could give you right standing in front of that holy and righteous and perfect God shows already that you don't have a correct view of God. And in fact, this view produces self-righteousness in you. If you think that God loves you or you have your right standing before God because of something that you have done, then you walk around thinking that you're quite an awesome person because my works have gained my right standing before God. So that's one problem with this line of thinking. The other is that it's up to that religion's standard to determine what good is. And so many of the world religions will tell you that your good works can enter you into eternity or into paradise, but it's up to that religion's standard to determine what that good deed is. And none of these standards come from the true biblical standard of God's goodness. And so this is how you wind up with extreme sects of religion, like the 9-11 terrorists who flew the planes there into the building. They thought they were doing a good deed according to their extreme version of their religion that was going to allow them to enter into paradise. And so when you think that your good deeds can enter into heaven, there has to be a, a standard for that goodness. And most of these other religions, their standard is not the biblical standard. And so there is a problem with that. And so almost everyone wrongly assumes that we can earn our right standing before God. And this rich young ruler, he comes up to Jesus and he asks him, what good deed must I do? Now, Jesus uses the man's question here to give a quick teaching on goodness. Verse 17, Jesus says to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. There is only one who is good, and that is God. God is good. There's a saying that God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. This is one of God's divine attributes. You, you can't have God without goodness. They're eternally linked. They'll forever be linked. You can't separate God from His goodness. And everything that He does flows out of that goodness. His excellence, His kindness, His love, it all comes out of His goodness. And so if there's anything that is good, if we see anything in this life that is good and beautiful, it comes from God. James 1.17 tells us every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Psalm 34.8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. How many of you this morning have already had a taste of God's goodness this morning as we've been in His presence worshiping Him? Many of you will go to lunch this afternoon and you'll taste and see that your enchiladas are good. As you do that, remind yourselves that the only way that you can even experience the goodness of those enchiladas is because you have a God that in Himself is good. But that, that's as we look out and we see creation, as you... Look to your left or your right and you see your beautiful spouse. It's a reminder of God's goodness. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of lights. And we could do a whole teaching this morning on God's goodness, but the point that Jesus here is making is that you are wrong in assuming that in yourself you could do something good to inherit eternal life. And again, this is where every religion besides Christianity gets it wrong. All other religions say you can earn your right standing before God. Christianity is the only one that says, no, we, we are not good. 
There, there's nothing that we could do to earn our right standing before God. It's only in the work of Christ. But many religions, in fact, in Japan, there's a, a Buddhist temple in Nara, Japan, with this massive wooden Buddha. And I've been there before, and he, he's sitting there on this, this throne with one hand out, saying, if, if you give to me, then his hand is, is blessing. So the idea is if you give enough, if you say enough prayers, if you throw enough coins into the little trough there before Buddha, then maybe he'll hear your prayers, maybe he will bless you, but it's all depending on what you give. That's not the Christian religion. We know that we can't do enough. We know that we can't give enough to earn our salvation. It's only a work of Christ. It's only faith in Christ. But then as of, uh, out of a result of that, as out of a result of God's goodness, we now give back with a heart overflowing of what He has done for us. We don't give trying to earn our right standing before God. We give because we have a right standing before God in Christ. And so Jesus answers the young ruler's question here by saying, there's only one that is good, but if you would enter life, Keep the commandments. If you want to deserve eternal life based on your works, so there, there is a way that you can earn eternal life. All you have to do is perfectly keep the Ten Commandments. Perfectly uphold God's law. In other words, be as good as God. So if you would enter eternal life, be as good as God. The young ruler here, he has the audacity to say, well, which ones do I need to keep? Jesus goes on to, to say in verse 18, he, he lists the, the second table of the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, honor your parents, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Now, at this point, the ruler's response should have been, Jesus, that's impossible, Nobody can do that. Nobody can perfectly uphold the law. Of course, I've broken the Ten Commandments. I disobeyed my parents when I was young or, or whatever. But that's, that wasn't his response. He says here, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? You see, Jesus here, what he was trying to do was lead the man to see his own depravity and his, home, his own need for salvation outside of himself. And so Jesus, he, he's leading him through a progression to come to the realization that in himself, he cannot be saved. He cannot inherit eternal life. That he needs a Savior. But he wasn't grasping this reality. He, he's still full, him, himself is full of self-righteousness, thinking that he can in himself earn eternal life. And Jesus' patience here needs to be commended. Jesus could have said, really, all these you've kept? You, you've, you didn't hear my teaching on the mount where I said, if you have anger in your heart, you've committed murder. If you have lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. But he didn't do that. Jesus was patient with this man. And we know he was patient with him because of his love for him. Jesus wasn't trying to stump this man. He wasn't trying to embarrass this man. He was simply trying to lead this man to a realization of his need for Christ. At this point in the story in Mark's Gospel, it says that Jesus looked on this man with love. After his response that he said he's kept all of the commandments, Jesus looks at him with love. Jesus cares for him. And so, as he was trying to lead him to a place to see he had fallen short, he continues to go on when he realized he, he hasn't gotten it yet. So Jesus gives him an answer that's going to force him to examine his heart. In verse 21, he says, If you would be perfect, if you have kept all the commandments, you say you've kept all of the commandments, you're a perfect man, apparently, Go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. 
When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So this answer that Jesus gives him, it worked. It it caused him to look deep into his heart, and the realization that the man had was he, he loved his possessions more than he loved Christ. It wasn't that Jesus was trying to get get rid of this man, so he just gave him this zinger that he knew would stump him and send him away. No, Jesus loved him. Jesus was getting him to examine his heart, to try to bring him to a place of recognizing his need. But this man simply loved his material wealth. He loved his stuff more than he loved Christ. He wasn't ready to trade his riches in for the pearl of great price that Jesus had to offer. Now some people will read this passage and say, look, Jesus is saying that we need to not have any possessions in this life. That if if you even have a home or you have a car that you're disobeying what Jesus commanded here. And, And this has led some people to purposefully live a life of poverty. But Jesus here, he he wasn't speaking to every disciple as a whole. He he recognized the heart of this one man, and he was specifically speaking to the rich young ruler because he knew it was exactly the truth that he needed to hear. And this interaction is a great example of how Jesus in his word can deal with all of us. God loves us so much that He gave us His his true, perfect Word that oftentimes can sting us. Oftentimes as we read it, it it can prick us and convict us and reveal the truth to us as Jesus just did here. And Jesus loves us so much that He's going to tell us the truth even if we don't want to hear it, even if it's a hard pill to swallow. We saw Jesus do this with the woman at the well when he brought up her love life. You know, surely this was something she didn't need to be reminded of, but Jesus was speaking the truth to her. He was revealing something in her life that needed to be changed. And so Jesus doesn't sugarcoat it here. He, he, he realizes this man's self-righteousness and he's pointing out his need for Christ. Now, verse 22 is such a sad verse that we have in Scripture. Where Jesus, he, he, out of love, He tells this man what he needs to hear. He, he gives this man what he needs to have eternal life. And this man rejects Him. This man walks away because he loved his possessions more than he loved Christ. A side note on this for those of us who share the gospel, as we read this passage, it should encourage us that if you share the gospel with someone and they walk away from you, you can rejoice because you're in good company. Jesus shared the gospel with this young man. He told this man what he needed for eternal life and he walked away from him. So don't let that stop you from sharing the gospel with someone. Well, what if they reject my message? What if they don't want to hear what I have to say? That's fine. They did the same with Jesus, the perfect preacher in whom, in whom there's perfect truth coming out of his mouth. So don't let that stop you from sharing the gospel with someone. But this choice that the rich young ruler made, I pray, is not a choice that any of us have made. We live in a world today that's so full of possessions, great possessions. We're so blessed in this country. The way that we live in this country today, we live like kings compared to how the most rich lived in Jesus' day. I mean, most of us today surely had to decide what we were going to wear to come to church. What a great thing that you have more than one outfit to wear. Back in Jesus' day, to have more than one tunic showed that you were richly blessed. All of us have this little device, this computer in our pockets where we can do millions of things with. TVs these days are as thin as a pencil. I mean, we have amazing possessions. We're so blessed in this life And in the day and age in which we live, 
to have so many possessions, but if we're not careful, we can let the love of these possessions rob the joy that we have in Christ. We can treasure what we own. We can treasure the the wealth that we have. That can become our God and it can minimize the need that we think we have in Christ. We cannot let that be the case. We cannot let our possessions become our greatest affection, our greatest treasure, our greatest satisfaction. That has to be in Christ alone. So, Again, people will read this and say, well, Jesus doesn't want you to have a phone. Jesus doesn't want you to have a car. He doesn't want you to have a house. You just need to live in a tent. No, Jesus isn't asking you to give up your cell phone. But if he did, would you be willing to do it? If Jesus came to you and said, I need you to give up your phone and come and follow me, I need you to get off of Facebook for the rest of your life and come and follow me. I need you to stop eating enchiladas. I knew that would get the biggest groan out of you. What a beautiful thing to live in San Antonio. But if he asked you to do these things, honestly, look in your heart. Would you have trouble? This is something that we need to truly wrestle with. Do we love our things more than we love the one who gave us these things? In his commentary on this passage, Warren Wearsby said, It is good to have the things money can buy, provided we do not lose the things that money cannot buy. Jesus said it this way in Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 34. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Verse 36 perfectly describes this rich young ruler. He had everything he could possibly need, but he was unwilling to trade it in to inherit what truly mattered, to inherit life eternal. Now, I don't believe God is anti-wealth. I don't believe God is anti-possessions, but I do believe that God cares about your heart. And if your wealth, if your possessions, if the, the things in this earth causes your heart to go astray from the Lord then you're in the exact same place that this rich young ruler is at and you need to bring those things before Christ and repent and ask Him to give you the the true satisfaction, the true living water that only He can give. And I'll be honest, there's been times in my life where I have had to do this. I've recognized that the things of this world, the cares of this life, the the possessions that I have have started to, to... get a little higher than my love and my joy for Christ. There's been a few times where that has happened, and I had to look honestly at myself and realize that was happening and bring it before the Lord and repent of those things. And I think this is something that all of us as believers need to do, not just one time, but often. That we need to take account of our lives. Where are we spending our time? When we're just resting, what is it that our thoughts go to? Are we thinking about God's goodness? Are we thinking about His mercies? Are we waking up thinking about His steadfast love in the morning as the psalmist says? Or are we waking up thinking, what did I miss on Twitter while I was sleeping? Let me go check that real quick. Or are we waking up thinking, did the Trump podcast with Rogan drop while I was sleeping last night. Let me spend three hours, my first three hours of the day to watch that. Where do your affections lie? Take an take a honest look at your heart. And I pray that as God reveals, if, if things are out of alignment, that you wouldn't harden your heart as this rich young ruler did, but that you would submit that to Christ 
lay it down at his feet and truly follow him. So let's move on as we continue now. The rich young ruler, he has rejected the gospel. He has rejected what Christ had to offer and he has walked away. Now Jesus uses this interaction as an opportunity to teach his disciples. Starting in verse 23, it says, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is the master teacher, and here he sees an opportunity to teach an important truth to his disciples. He didn't just say, oh, well, that stinks for that young man. Let's, let's go and eat some lunch. No, he, he saw an opportunity here to teach a kingdom truth to his disciples. And here Jesus, he's, he's being a good shepherd. This is what a good shepherd does, that he doesn't just teach his disciples on, on Sunday morning, but all throughout their lives we see his example of ministry, that he was constantly discipling his disciples. And this is a, a good example for us as parents. You know, we don't just hand them over to Sunday school for 30 minutes a week and then we don't shepherd them at all the rest of the week. No, we should constantly be looking for opportunities to teach them kingdom truths as Jesus did here with his disciples. So Jesus here, he's using hyperbolic language to illustrate how difficult it is for a wealthy person to inherit eternal life. How difficult it is for them to trust in Christ instead of their possessions. The camel was the largest known land animal in that region. So Jesus was using the largest animal that the disciples could think of and also the smallest opening that was known, the eye of a needle. Essentially here, what Jesus is describing is impossible. There, there's no way that this could happen. And again, some people will look at this and take it to mean that Christians shouldn't be wealthy. That if you're a rich Christian, that you're disobeying Scripture and you're not doing what Jesus teaches. But that's not the case. In fact, in, in Scripture, in, in many examples in the Old Testament, we see that oftentimes part of the blessing that comes with obeying God's law is material possessions and wealth. And that's how the Jewish culture at the time viewed those who were wealthy. In, the, in the, that day, if you were wealthy, it was a sign that God had blessed you. Which is why when, when Jesus gives this response, it says the disciples were astonished. Because Jesus was saying that those that the culture viewed as blessed by God would have extreme difficulty entering the kingdom. But a few examples in the Old Testament that shows that those who obey God's law will have wealth. I, I just want to put this before you because I think that Yes, here at Christ is King Church, we are very anti-prosperity gospel. We do not teach that if you, if you sow and sow into the kingdom, that God wants you to be a millionaire, God wants you to own jets, and all you need to simply do is give a lot of money to make the pastors rich, and in turn, you will have all this material possessions. We don't believe that, but a lot of times, we can go to the extreme to where we'll say, well... God doesn't want you to have any wealth at all. So I just want to show you that that's not biblical. So Deuteronomy 28 is an amazing chapter in the Old Testament where God details a life of blessing if you obey the law, but also a life of curses if you disobey the law. And as a side note, what's interesting in Deuteronomy 28 is the curses that come for disobedience is like triple the amount of the blessings that come with obedience. So that should be a warning to all of us who aren't following the law of God. But in verse 11, an example of this, in Deuteronomy 28, it says, The Lord will make you abound in prosperity. And it talks about that you will be fruitful in your family, in your cattle, in your harvest. 
And then Psalm 112, Psalm 112, verses 1 through 3, it says, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. So we're not to look at wealth as a curse or look at wealth as being disobedient to God. No, oftentimes that's a sign of God blessing us. We just have to guard against making an idol and making a God out of that wealth or out of the pursuit of that wealth, which is what many end up doing as they pursue wealth and pursue possessions. So the disciples here, they, they respond in amazement at this response again because Jesus was saying those that were culturally looked at as blessed by God would have a difficult time entering the kingdom. And so the disciples, in their astonishment, they say, who then can be saved? If the wealthy, those who are blessed by God, have difficulty entering the kingdom of God, what what hope do those of us who don't have wealth have of entering God's kingdom? They ask a great question here. This this example that Jesus uses, it it gets to them. They're they're on the right track here. They're, They're starting to realize it. They're coming to a better place than the rich young ruler did. And so they ask this great question. And Jesus responds with an even better answer. With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. This is what Jesus was conveying to the rich young ruler all along, but his hard heart was keeping him from grasping this truth. The rich young ruler thought it was possible for him to do something in himself to be saved. He thought it was possible that he he, he was obviously blessed by God. He was rich. He was a young man. He had acquired his wealth at a young age. He had, in his eyes, been doing the right thing. All that he needed was God to tell him, Jesus to tell him one more thing he needed to do to cross over that threshold to have eternal life. In himself, he thought he was good enough that he could do something to save himself. Jesus says, this is impossible. It's impossible for anyone on their own to inherit the kingdom of God. This is true for everybody. It's impossible for the rich, it's impossible for the poor, and it's impossible for everyone in between to inherit the kingdom of God. Whether you live in Napa Napa Valley, California, or whether you live in the dumpster of the parking lot of a Napa Auto Parts, (laughs) wherever you are on that spectrum, it's impossible for you yourself to save yourself. And this is what Jesus is conveying here. This is what he was trying to convey to the rich young ruler. He was just too in love with his wealth, too in love with his possessions to hear the truth. But thank God there is a but in this verse. There's a lot of great buts in the Bible, and this is one of them. With man, it is impossible, but... With God, all things are possible. And so, while with man it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or somewhere in between, the same is true with God. God is no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter if you're rich. It doesn't matter if you're poor. It doesn't matter if you've broken only one of the Ten Commandments or you've broken all Ten of the commandments that they have to make even more commandments because you've broken even more of them. Wherever you're at, you can be saved by God. John 3.16, it's the verse all of us know, but here it, it applies so perfectly. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever, whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. You see, the issue isn't your bank account. The issue is your heart. And all of our hearts outside of Christ are wicked. 
Isaiah tells us that our, our righteousness, our good deeds, our good works, our filthiness, they're a filthy rag. And if you want to take some time and do some deeper study on what exactly that filthy rag was, you can do that on your own. But just understand, Isaiah was conveying that your righteousness is nothing, that you cannot in yourself have a right standing before God. This is what Jesus was conveying to the disciples. But thank God for Christ. Amen. With Christ, whoever, whoever believes in the Son will have eternal life. So have you trusted in the Son? Have you trusted in Christ? Do you believe in Christ? Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. Jesus lived the life that the rich young ruler had fooled himself into thinking that he had lived. Jesus was the only one to truly uphold all of God's commandments perfectly. Jesus lived a sinless life so that he could lay down his life as a sacrifice for your sins. My daughter's agreeing with me. Jesus lived a life that you could not live so that he could die a life that you could not die. As Jesus died on the cross, he, he satisfied God's wrath. He, he satisfied God's justice that was poured out that our sin earned. Romans 6, it says the wages of sin, what we have earned for our sin, what we have earned for our deeds, what we have earned in ourselves is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of the work of Christ, all things are possible with God. Because of Christ, you can be saved. Because He poured out His perfect blood on the cross, your sins can be atoned for. So whether you have a lot or you have a little... You have to come to the place where you trust in Christ and Him only for your salvation. And then for those of us who are, who are saved, we have to be sure that we're trusting in Christ and Christ alone for our joy, for our satisfaction, for our peace, for our comfort. Because if we begin to look at the things of this world for those things, our hearts will begin to be pulled away from Christ you see, everything in this life fades away. Everything. A thousand years from now, uh, none of this will be here. What, what we have in this life will not last. There's only one thing of ours that will live on, and, and that is our souls. What do you treasure in this life? What is it? that you care about most? What is it that you spend time thinking about? What is it that your affections go to? Is it the things of this world or is it the beauty in Christ and His sacrifice and His love that was poured out for you? Over the last month, we've seen the, the frailty of stuff as these hurricanes have come and just wreaked havoc on cities as people's lives work Everything that they worked for, all of their possessions, their homes were just gone in an instant, showing the frailty of this life. But Christ, He offers us something that, that can't rust, that can't fade away, that can't be taken away by a hurricane. He offers us something that will never fade away, the greatest treasure that you could ever have. He offers us Himself. So look to Christ in faith today. Look to Him for your joy. Look to Him for your satisfaction. Look to Him for your peace. I know I've quoted this hymn more than once in a sermon, but turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face and the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Look to Christ for your satisfaction Look to Christ for your salvation. Quickly here, let's look at these last few verses. Starting in verse 27, Peter decides to inject himself into the story with quite a Peter-like question. 
where he says, see, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Lord, we've done what the rich young ruler could not do. We've given up everything to follow you. So what is our reward going to be? I love Peter because he reminds us that these disciples were real men. They were real people. They had real thoughts, just like many of us. If we can be honest, many of us, if we were in the disciples' shoes or sandals, would be thinking the same thing. We've done what this rich young ruler cannot do. What, what reward are we going to get now that we have given up everything to follow Christ? Now Jesus here, he again was patient with them. He didn't rebuke Peter here. He, he goes on to reveal a truth about the disciples in the new earth. Jesus says that they will play a part in judging Israel. Now, exactly what this looks like is debated. There's many thoughts on what Jesus was talking about here. But we do have a couple of examples in Scripture that I would like to highlight. The first is in Ephesians 2.20, where Paul says that the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. So we have this, this idea of the apostles being the foundation of the church. And then in Revelation 21, where John shares the vision of the new Jerusalem, he speaks of the city having 12 gates, and on those gates was written the 12 tribes of Israel. And then it says that the city had 12 pillars as its foundations, and the, the names of the disciples were written on each of these pillars. So exactly how this will look or when it will take place is unclear, but what we do know from these scriptures is that the disciples were to play a, a, a big role in the future church. This is what Jesus was conveying to them. Now Jesus closes this section by saying in verse 29, And everyone who has left house or brothers, sisters, father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. This last verse, verse 30, uh, Abraham will get into more next week as we look at another parable. But verse 29, everyone who forsakes all for me will receive a hundredfold. Jesus is saying he is going to take care of you. He's going to look after you. If whatever it is that you have to give up in this life to follow Him, He's going to provide for you. He's going to take care of you. He's not going to call you to step out in obedience and then leave you high and dry. He's going to give you more than will make up for what you have given up. You see, Jesus will... Whether he blesses you with material possessions, when you come to Christ, he will give you his peace, he will give you his joy, he will give you his love, he will pour out his Holy Spirit onto you, giving you the fruits of his Holy Spirit. He will also give you all of the promises that we have in Ephesians chapter 1. You'll receive adoption into the kingdom, you'll receive redemption through his blood, you'll receive the forgiveness of your sins. You'll also receive an inheritance as a child of God that cannot be taken from you. These are some of the things that Christ gives you in a hundredfold, as he says. All of these promised spiritual blessings will be yours. No, no matter what material possessions you have in life, you can, you can trust and you can know that God is going to bless you spiritually if you forsake all if you take up your cross and follow him. If, if you were to, to lose everything in this life, but you have Christ, you have more than everything. Uh, another, another hymn says, take the world, but give me Jesus. Th this is the attitude that all of us need to have. Lord, guard my heart to, to whatever it is that you bless me with. If I have any material possessions in this life, Lord, that I wouldn't idolize it, that I wouldn't trust in these things, that I wouldn't find my satisfaction in these things, but that I would trust in you, ultimately knowing that it came from you. 
Colossians 1 says this about Christ, that in Christ we have the one in whom all things were created. So all things were created in Christ. It also says all things were created for Christ. But then it also says that in Christ he is holding all things together. So don't trust in your things. Don't trust in your stuff. Don't trust in your possessions. Trust in the one who is holding all of these things together. He, he's, holding, he's holding your life in his hands. He, he's going to take care of you. So don't trust in your stuff. Don't trust in your wealth. Don't trust in sports teams. Don't trust in the Cowboys. Don't trust in the next president. Trust in the one who is holding all of these things. Trust in the one who is in control of all of these things. And that is Christ. So in closing today, I want to ask, what, what is it that you are holding on to? Is there something in your life that you know if you're honest, it's, it's on the throne? And Christ is just a little bit lower. Turn to Christ. For, forsake these things. Now, I'm not saying you have to go cold turkey and never watch a Cowboys game again. But if you're sitting in here right now and what you're thinking about while I'm preaching is kickoff at 7.20 tonight, maybe you should fast the game tonight and spend some time in prayer. Be honest with yourself. Do not harden your heart as the rich young ruler did and walk away from Christ. Christ is here today offering you eternal life, offering you spiritual blessings that will last throughout all eternity. Grab on to the blessings of Christ today. Don't make the mistake of the rich young ruler. You see, he wanted what Christ had to offer. He wanted eternal life that comes in Christ, but he didn't want Christ. And this is where many people are. Many people come to Christ wanting fire insurance. Many people come to Christ wanting, wanting the Savior, wanting what Christ has to offer, but they really don't want Christ as Lord. They, they don't want to submit to Him as Lord of their lives. They don't want to accept the fact that Christ is King and lay down their lives in submission to Him as King. Yes, we celebrate Christ the Savior. I mean, that's why we're here today, because Christ has saved us. He has set us free. But Christ also must be your Lord, which I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're at Christ is King Church. But it's important that we oftentimes take, take stock of our heart. Where, where is our heart truly at? What do we treasure where do our affections lie? And if we see that it's gotten out of balance, we need to be willing to lay that at the feet of Christ and trust that He will give us a satisfaction that nothing in this life can bring. And so this morning, I, I charge you, let go of whatever it is that's keeping you from trusting in Christ completely and turn to Him in faith, knowing that He will give you joy. He will give you peace. And ultimately, he will give you eternal life. Amen.